and a dictionary. Just be, uh, before we go into the different um, conditions, uh, just a quick refresher, because we're going to use a few of the terms that we covered earlier. So I just thought I'd refresh everyone's memory. Um, graph theory is a study of graphs. And what it sets out to do is model pairwise connections between different objects. And the way we can uh, study um, different networks is by looking at nodes and then studying how they're connected to each other, which is defined as edges. And we talked previously about uh, how graph theory came about uh, through the work of Euler, and I won't go into that. But for the brain, uh, breaking it down into nodes and edges uh, becomes a very interesting and powerful tool. And the first thing you have to do is defined, define what you're going to call a node. And we talked about um, different parcellation schemes, and particularly we talked about the Glasser Atlas, which is one such parcellation scheme that breaks down the brain into a node. But depending on how different scientists decide to study the brain, um, there's a lot of different models for the definition of nodes. Um, some people might just use gross anatomical terms. Other people might use more defined atlases, um, et cetera, et cetera. Then the next aspect of studying a brain in terms of graph theory is deciding what type of connectivity are you going to study? Are you going to study a structural connectivity, i.e. are we going to use diffusion MRI where we're looking at a node, which is an anatomical part, and a node at another anatomical part and studying how white matter tracts uh, connect between them. The other type of network analysis is a functional um, uh, MRI um, network analysis, where we're essentially studying functional connectivity, i.e., again, we're defining two nodes, and then we're looking at the time series data from a functional MRI and breaking down through statistical methods uh, the waveforms uh, to deduce if two different areas of the brain are talking to each other in essence. And there's different types of terms that we use in, in graph theory and analysis of graphs, which we can apply to the brain as we'll see later today. So I'll just cover some of the basic terms which we've done before. We talked about the degree of a node, i.e. if we look at this node here, it's got a degree of four. It's connected to this node, to that node, to that node, and that node to make a total of four connections. Network strength is the average degree over the entire network. So if you're going to look at every single node and calculate how many uh, edges they have and then divide it by the total number of nodes, you'll get a network strength metric. A clustering coefficient is if you look at a particular part of the graph, what's the probability that two nodes are connected to each other? So if, if, uh, if a module is more connected, it's got a higher clustering coefficient. And if it's less connected, that coefficient is lower. We talked about shortest path, i understanding how efficient information transfer is in a graph. So if we want to get A to D, the shortest path is going via B and C, as opposed to going from B to this node, to that node, to that node, and so on until we get to D. And if we look at an entire graph, we can calculate a path length, which is um, an average of all the um, shortest paths throughout the graph, i.e. looking at every node, how it's connected to another node and calculating the shortest path. And that will give us a path length. The shorter the path length is for the entire graph, the more efficient it is. The other metric we look at is centrality, which is a measure of um, how important nodes are, i.e. node B is a hub. It has a higher centrality than this node here. Finally, we can look at modules, which is parts of a graph. Hubs, which are nodes that are, have high connectivity and connect to other modules in the graph. And there's a term called rich club which is the connections of all the highly connected nodes to each other. We also talked about previously about small world networks. And the way we can study those is 
by first st starting with the normal lattice network where each node is connected to its neighbor. While this has a very fairly high clustering coefficient, it's really bad in transferring information to distant parts. So I, its mean path length is very long because if you wanted to get to this node, you'd have to travel all the way around the circle. In a small world network, we rewire it where some of the nodes actually make long connections, not all of them, just a few of them. But what that does is it allows us to keep our high clustering coefficient, but also develop a short um, mean path length. And this type of organization is very common in the brain and in lots of complex networks um, found throughout nature and things like the internet and social networks. So it's a pattern which is very efficient in information transfer. Um, we also touched on complex systems, which are essentially large networks which are very diverse, they're interconnected with many interdependent variables and adaptive parts. And the brain is a complex system, and they show some uh, properties which we discussed, such as emergence, i.e. even if we understand all these little pairwise connections of how neurons are connected to each other, we'll never explain at our current level of knowledge how this can transform into enjoying music or playing a violin or doing incredibly complicated things that humans do. Um, we talked about the statistics of complex systems where they show something called a power law distribution, which unlike a normal distribution has elements which uh, show a high frequency, um, but there are parts of the graph which show tremendous outliers. So if, if we were going to give an example for height, so a normal distribution of height you know, an average height will be one meter 60, and we will get outliers, which will be two meters, uh, two meters 10, and one meter 30 or one meter 40. But the chance that we will get someone who's four meters tall or five meters tall is zero. Whereas if height was distributed along a power law distribution, while the majority of people's height would be 160, 170, it wouldn't be impossible for someone to be five or 10 meters tall. The same thing applies to brain connections. While the majority of uh, axons connect to each other a few millimeters away, you do get axons that can uh, travel distances of more than a meter long. Finally, complex systems show robustness, i.e. if you attack or remove nodes from the graph, it doesn't make the entire graph fall to pieces. So information can transfer through alternative routes. And this property of being robust um, to attacks is actually called robustness. Okay, so the first um, condition we'll talk about is depression. Uh, we've touched on this topic about the study by Drisdell where uh, th this group compared patients with depression versus patients uh, with no neurological problems or mood disorders. And what they set out to do is if we study the functional connectivity of uh, patients with depression and compare it to normal patients, can we tell a difference? And can we build a machine learning model that could differentiate between depressed patients and non-depressed patients? And as we said previously, it works. So based on their machine learning model, they could detect uh, who has depression and who doesn't at a sensitivity level of 90% uh, and a specificity level above 90%. And they also modeled four different biotypes of depression. So the take home message from this study is you can use resting state fMRIs, you can apply machine learning, and you can build a system which can recognize functional connectivity differences between patients with depression and patients that don't have depression, i.e. it shows that depression is a, is a connectivity problem. Now, the next two studies which we haven't covered and I'd like to bring to your attention is uh, from Michael Fox uh, from Harvard group. And his first study tries to understand how does TMS work is he's trying, we know that TMS is um, applied to the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, but it doesn't work for everyone. And, you know, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex actually has 27 parcellations. So how do we know that we're stimulating the, the right parcellation? And, and this is one of the arguments against non-navigated uh, TMS, where you just are almost um, randomly applying the coil to the lateral part of the frontal lobe. 
So what was known is that there's an area called uh, area 25, which we've covered uh, previously, also known as a subcolossal uh, cingulate gyrus. And the, the function of this uh, parcellation is to determine emotional uh, valence of internal and external stimuli. And it's also important for maternal infant um, interactions. But what studies um, have shown is that this part of the brain is very important in mood disorders, and it's actually a target in deep brain stimulation. And it's an interesting target because it also has a pathway to the thalamus. And one of the main mechanisms of depressions is thought to arise from um, abnormal rhythms from the thalamus that get distributed to the, to the frontal lobes. So what, uh, what Fox did is he wanted to study how on a functional MRI, how are the different parts of the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex um, synchronized with, the, with area 25? So the subcolossal uh, cingulate uh, cortex. And what he did is he took different areas based on different targets that are used on TMS. And what he found was that the, the part of the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex area 46 is the target that had the highest anti-correlation, um, i.e. blue, uh, with the sub uh, um, uh, cortex area 25. So if we look on the graph on the right side, this is showing correlation with area 25 um, for each of the different targets. And what we see is area 46 has the highest anti-correlation. So what he deduced from that is that potentially this is the best target for, for TMS area 46, and especially in patients that um, when you're analyzing their individual connectome, they're showing anti-correlation with area 46. So then he set, set out to treat patients uh, with TMS based on targeting 46 and also analyzing its anti-correlation with area 25. So in this far graph uh, C, what we see is uh, in the y-axis, estimated clinical efficacy of the TMS. So how good was uh, the patient's improvement in the mood disorder? And on the x-axis, we have um, a correlation with, the sub, uh, with area 25. And what we find is for the patients that had the highest anti-correlation in 25 and were treated um, with area 46, they also showed the highest clinical improvement. So this is just showing the importance of uh, individual variation and also looking at targets at a more sophisticated level based on a detailed uh, brain maps. The next study by, uh, by Fox, um, which was a combination of multiple uh, institutions, including Harvard, was we know that there's non-invasive stimulation such as TMS, and we know that there's invasive stimulation such as deep brain stimulation. But research-wise, because one's invasive and one's not, these fields have diverged considerably. So the aim of this study was to look at different conditions that are treated with both non-invasive stimulation such as TMS and invasive stimulation such as DBS and look at the actual targets that have led to efficacy. Then the main hypothesis was that even though these targets are at different areas, potentially they're linked through a same uh, functional MRI network. So um, what the group did is they looked at lots of different conditions, but I'll, I'll just talk about depression because that's what we're highlighting. So when you look at the literature and we look at TMS, uh, we all know that the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex has uh, shown efficacy. But when we look at the um, experimental studies in deep brain stimulation, the subgenual target uh, comes up again. And it's actually one of the best um, targets for depression if you were gonna use deep brain stimulation for depression. So the next part of the study was to actually Look at um, area 25, um, that subgenual area that we talked about, and then look at its functional connectivity. So, i.e., which parts of the brain are in sync with the same time series as area 25. So, this image here of the a brain on the right shows all the areas that are active and in sync with area 25. Surprise, surprise, area 46 does come up. But what's very interesting is there's a lot of other targets that are in sync with area um, at 25. 
And this actually opens up different areas as potential targets for TMS and efficacy. And with the navigated TMS that um, we've been using, um, area T1M uh, comes up very often and has been shown to be efficacious, and that's on the temporal lobe, as does PGS, which is in that interparietal sulcus. And what's interesting is both of these areas that we use are actually anticorrelated with um, area 25. Um, I didn't show an example of a case this week. Um, we're going to have Mike Shiguru giving us a talk next week, and uh, I'm sure he'll uh, likely go through some cases. But what I wanted to summarize is how do we make all this practical, i.e., if, if, um, you know, if you wanted to start using the Omniscient platform to look at your patient's connectome and potentially looking at a case of depression and trying to decide if treatment's possible and what to hit, how would you do it? So the first thing to do is um, look at the network structures. So click on that default mode and central executive network and actually look at the structures. And not that initially you will see anything obvious, uh, which will be abnormal with your patient, but it's a good idea to do it for academic reasons. So you can actually famili familiarize yourself with where are these networks. Potentially with a lot of experience, you can start to see if um, some of the networks have less bulk to them, or their actual connectivity is um, a little bit decreased based on the wire diagram. But in general, it's an academic part to just familiarize yourself with the networks. Then the next part of the analysis is to actually look at the connectomic. So what you wanna do is initially look at the, the central executive network and the default mode network um, by itself and actually pick up, do I have red and blue squares, which are showing abnormality in connectivity, i.e. hyperconnectivity and hyperconnectivity, or do I not? So in this CEN, we've got quite a few uh, blue and um, red squares, which show connectivity abnormalities compared to our cohort of normal patients. And we've got um, two, two parcellations in the default mode network with some abnormality. But in making a treatment plan, the best thing to do is to actually combine both of these um, networks, so the CN and the DMN, and then trying to look at the vertical columns and each one of these vertical columns correlates to parcellation and trying to deduce which ones has the most abnormalities. And that's probably your best target for personalized TMS. What I've done here is I've also added area 46 and area 25, um, which you can do when you're doing the analysis to see if anything comes up on that connectomic as well. The main principle is so to pick a target though with which has the most abnormalities and one that will be on the surface of the brain. So there's some usual targets that come up with depression, which is good to know and good to seek out because they potentially provide good targets. And these ones are 46, which we discussed, but we also often see 8AB, T1M on the temporal lobe and PGS in the interparietal sulcus. Um, what you'll notice 46 is in the middle frontal uh, gyrus anteriorly and 8AB is just posterior to that. All right, so let's go on and talk about a condition we haven't talked about yet in this series, uh, purely from a scientific interest point of view. So schizophrenia is uh, what we'll cover now and that's a prototypical disorder of brain connectivity. Uh, first described, um, well, not first described, but Wernicke first described it as a connectivity disorder. And he thought it was a problem with the association fibers and that their connections were abnormal. And this, um, this was quoted by him in 1901. Um, it's characterized by effective deficits, positive symptoms, such as delusions, hallucinations, and thought disorder, negative uh, symptoms, such as flattened uh, affect and volitional disturbances. One of the big problems is that it really lacks a reliable biomarker. So yes, we can pick up the, the condition clinically, but can we really tell anything about a schizophrenic uh, brain on a structural MRI? On a purely structural MRI, the answer is no. Um, but if we look at diffusion imaging, the answer is yes. So if schizophrenia is thought to be a, a condition of connectivity, um, what have studies shown that actually look at the white matter tracts, i.e. structural connectivity in patients with schizophrenia? So in this study, they used a diffusion imaging on a cohort of patients with schizophrenia, and it, they compared it to a cohort of patients with uh, normal young adult brains. 
And what they found was globally, there was a reduction in, in white uh, matter connections, but the parts that were actually significantly different were the parts connecting the medial frontal lobes bilaterally. And that was the forceps minor, uh, that was the anterior um, limb of the internal capsule, as well as uh, parts of the body and the genu of the corpus callosum, which of course makes the, the forceps minor. But from a significance point of view, that was the part of the brain that showed the highest uh, structural aberration compared to um, normal adult brains. What have functional studies shown? So this um, very nice paper from Fornito et al. Uh, looked at schizophrenia in three different settings. So chronic schizophrenia, childhood onset schizophrenia, and first episode uh, schizophrenia. And they used functional MRIs to look at global connectivity metrics. And they looked at network strength, i.e. Um, how strong is the network connecting the brain? So looking at all the, um, looking at all the, the nodes and looking at their degree and calculating what the average degree, so the average connections of all those nodes are. And when you actually compare patients um, with uh, schizophrenia, which is the red line in the graph and controls, what you see in all three different settings is that their network strengths are considerably reduced, i.e. the interconnectivity uh, of the entire brain is, is reduced. Another study by Lay et al. Um, last year decided to use uh, machine learning uh, to try and understand which parts of the brain of schizophrenic patients are significantly different to normal patients, and can we build a machine learning uh, model to detect patients with schizophrenia based on functional connectivity compared to patients with normal brains? And they used three different methods um, for machine learning, logistic um, regression, uh, support vector machine, and deep learning. And in essence, they could get to a predictive accuracy of 81%. Um, depending on data, uh, um, you can improve this significantly, but in this particular study, they got up to an 81% accuracy of detecting who had schizophrenia and who didn't. And the areas that consistently came up as um, different um, in, when one compares schizophrenia to normal brains were the thalamus, the presensual gyrus, and that uh, temporal pole inferior temporal uh, gyrus area. Another study by Bloch set out to look at the actual uh, connectivity of the brain and try and look at how connected are each of the brain modules with each other, uh, i.e. connectivity within a module, and how is connectivity different between schizophrenic um, patients and controls when you're comparing the connectivity outside of modules. So in this, in this uh, study, we've got two groups, a control group and a child onset schizophrenia group. So the graph on, on the left, what that does is it looks at the, the connectivity within an actual module, i.e. the edges, the lines, how are they connecting within a module? And what we find is in, the, in control normal patients, just over 75, uh, three quarters of connections are within a module. Whereas when we compare that to uh, childhood onset schizophrenia, only 67% of connections are within a module. So that's, that's pretty significant, that's, to, that's almost 10%. When we're looking at the communication of the modules to each other, in a normal brain, we've got about 24% of modules, uh, connections within a module, uh, connecting to outside modules, whereas in a schizophrenic brain, that's 33%. So what we've actually got is, if you think about it, a bit of an aberration of that small world network. So we've got a bit more of a chaotic organization where we've got less connectivity within the module and more connectivity outside of the modules. And essentially, that's got uh, big implications for, for network efficiency. So if we take this a step further and apply graph theory metrics to schizophrenia, on the top graph, what we're actually doing is we're studying different nodes within a brain uh, of schizophrenic patients and uh, normal controls and looking how many of those nodes are highly connected nodes. And what we actually see is as we go 
um, to nodes with higher degrees, we've got a larger amount of control um, brains with higher nodes, whereas schizophrenic uh, brains have a lower frequency of highly connected nodes. I.e., um, we, we're not showing that power law distribution and we are sort of going against the, the small world architecture of uh, structural connectivity in the brain. H how does this compare if we look at it as a graph? So a normal, a normal node or a normal control brain tends to ha um, have nodes that are connected to a central node, which is a hub, which then connects to other parts of the brain. If we were to model this on the schizophrenic brain, we don't really have that type of architecture with nodes that have a very high degree. Instead, we've got a nodes that are connected uh, to each other, say in a circle. Now, if we actually instituted an attack on that network, so if we attack this network and we took node three in a normal brain, the whole network falls apart. So basically we only left, if we take out node three and all its edges, we're only left with one connection between four and five. If we took out three in a schizophrenic brain, we've still got the majority of the other connections. So if you attack the network, the schizophrenic brain works better than what a normal brain um, works. And what's interesting is some of the more recent studies seem to think that potentially uh, there's an evolutionary advantage of having a robust network, and it might be why a lot of the schizophrenic genes are still propagated. Um, there's still a lot of debate about it. One of the more recent theories uh, when you're looking at schizophrenia and graph theory. Okay, the next condition we'll look at in a little bit more detail is addiction. Um, you know, it's a problem that leads to excessive drug seeking and taking behavior and also has fundamental changes in people's cognition and processing of emotion. It leads to a relapsing and chronic cycles of intoxication, binging, withdrawal, and craving uh, that ultimately leads to, to use that's of substances that's uh, uncontrollable, even though it, it's got lots of adverse consequences and patients actually feel that they have a, a reduced pleasure to the actual drug. One of the main underlying theories of addiction in connectomics is impaired response inhibition and salience attribution, which basically breaks down drug seeking behavior into two broad neuropsychological domains. So one is response inhibition. Uh, so the inability to, to stop and then salience attribution where your brain essentially gives uh, dr drug seeking behavior and um, the administration of drugs to yourself, overwhelming importance. So there's a very interesting um, systemic review from Silverstand et al. And what they did is they went through all the um, fMRI studies on addiction and, and essentially wanted to analyze which networks have been studied in addiction and which networks have shown to be important in addiction. And they analyzed a total of 105 studies. And these included studies on alcohol, cannabis, cocaine, ecstasy, uh, heroin, uh, nicotine, and um, methamphetamines. And they found that there's actually six networks that are involved in addiction. Um, so we'll go through them. The executive network, which is the same as a central executive network, which we've talked about. Um, the salience uh, networks and, of course, the executive networks important for executive function, working memory, but in the context of addiction, it's uh, responsible for response selection. So what's an addicted person going to do? Are they going to seek the drug and take it or are they not? The other network that's shown to be important is a salience network. We've described it as the switch network between the DMN and the CN, but it's also very important in um, in giving different aspects importance, uh, different items in importance, and essentially it redirects all of our attention. And that we've shown was predominantly in the insula, the anterior cingulate cortex, and then to parietal um, sulcus areas. The other network is the reward network, so the basal uh, forebrain areas with the basal nuclei, such as nucleus accumbens, um, the anterior cingulate cortices, and um, the orbitofrontal cortices. 
And again, that's if we went if we go back to our lecture on architectonics, that's the paleo paleodon, so the ancient brain, the first brain that we had that's actually um, responsible for us smelling and and seeking food. In the context of addiction, it's important for appraising a a subjective value. There's the habit network, which involves the basal ganglia, the cortators and, and putamen. And that's important for automatic behavior. So what the cordate does is it initiates an automatic behavior and the putamen uh, reinforces it and helps us learn. And if you think about a lot of drug addiction, it becomes automatic behavior. And that's why this network is important. The default mode network um, with the, the medial prefrontal cortex and the interparietal sulcus and the uh, precuneus we've talked about, that's responsible for internal thinking, um, self-focused cognitive processes. The last network involved in addiction, uh, which this study found was the memory network and which involves the hippocampus and the parahippocampal gyre. And of course, that's important for learned behavior and also for us being flexible. So able to change learning uh, patterns based on experience. Okay, so they looked at the different elements of drug addiction and analyzed how are these networks um, active or not active during different aspects of addiction. So they studied 23 um, task-related neuroimaging studies, which essentially used visual drug cues. So you're studying addicted patients, you're showing them a, a drug and then studying what the networks do in the brain. And there's actually no surprise here. What happens is all the networks are just hyper-focused, hyperactive, um, and essentially the alarm bells uh, are ringing. So we've got a very hyperactive salience and reward network. These were the most active networks, but the executive network, the habit network, uh, the default mode network and the memory network are all super active. So how we interpret that is when someone's exposed to a drug and they're addicted to it, the entire brain just hyper focuses and is essentially screaming for, for, for that drug. Now, they also studied other elements, um, such as decision making. Um, and what they did here is they, they studied 14 task related neuroimaging studies. And the, the importance of uh, this, this aspect of the study was to look at how do addicted people make decisions. And this is in relation to non-drug related decisions. So the most common paradigm they used here was something called an Iowa gambling task where they put the patients in a gambling situation and there's either a, you can either do this task by betting small amounts of money and generally accumulating your money and winning or you can choose to bet on large amounts of money and you usually lose and end up uh, losing money so what they did is they studied the networks during um, this task in addicted patients. And what they found is that all the networks, when you compare it to normal people, are switched off. So the salience and reward networks in particular were switched off. But so were the executive the habit network and the, and the default mode network. It's almost as if that task wasn't given any importance or any salience and the brain wasn't particularly focusing on it. They also looked at inhibitory controlled in um, addict patients, again, in, in a non-drug related setting. So they studied 30 task related uh, studies and most of them used uh, go, no go tasks or stop signal tasks. And what they found again is that when you study the networks in this setting, um, the salience network in particular isn't active, but the executive and the memory networks are not active as well. So again, it's a non-drug related task and the networks are in essence not focusing on it. Um, the other aspect they looked was social emotional processing, again, in a non-drug related setting. And they studied 20 um, task related neuro neuroimaging studies. And what the paradigm here was is that uh, patients with addiction and normal patients were presented uh, a face, which was either smiling or crying or a baby. Um, and their, their response was studied, as was the response of their brain networks based on the fMRIs. Again, there is a global shutdown of uh, all of the networks in, in the addict patients. 
So if we look so far apart from a drug queue where you're actually looking at um, a drug, the, the remainder of the paradigms that we've looked at, the networks are all shut down. They also looked at um, in they looked at children or youth who had a, a risk factor for becoming an addict in the, in the future, i.e. they were a, a child of an alcoholic parent. And what they did was they looked at these adolescents who didn't have an addiction problem and they put them in an inhibitory control um, paradigm and then they studied their fMRI, i.e. that stop-go task. And what they found was that compared to normal adolescents, when this child was given the, the inhibitory task, again, their networks were less engaging. So their executive network, their salience network, and their habit networks were, were less on in essence compared to, to normal patients. And interestingly, if you had this biotype of networks, it, it basically predicted heavy alcohol drinking within four to five years. So you could actually predict if, the, if this youth was at risk and was going to follow on in their hereditary risk of um, having alcohol dependence. You can also use um, fMRI studies to predict the relapse. So this series of fMRIs using uh, five task related neuroimaging studies was used to predict if our previous addicts would relapse. So addicts in rehab, what was the chance that they were going to relapse? And they used two different paradigms. So one was exposing patients to drug cues. And then the other par uh, paradigm was inhibitory control. Sorry, there was a third paradigm with uh, social emotional processing. What they found is that patients that were going to relapse had a very hyperactive salience um, and reward network when they were exposed to drug cues as they did a habit network. But the salience network uh, reduced in activity under inhibitory control paradigms and the reward network decreased in activity in social and emotional paradigms. The executive network for both inhibitory and social emotional paradigms had decreased activity. If you had this profile of networks, um, in a heroin addict, you could predict relapse in 90 days. And in, in cocaine users, you could predict a, a positive uh, urine screen one week later, as opposed to um, addicts that didn't have this uh, network profile. Uh, finally, um, is there a role for resting state in addiction? And the answer is yes. So they looked at 23 studies. And what they found, interestingly, was that when you're looking at the, the salience network, the reward network, the habit and the memory network, Generally, these networks in the resting states, uh, fMRI, are segregated. But in addicts, they tend to um, fire together. So they're more integrated with each other, which is uh, completely abnormal. Um, on the contrary, when you're looking at the executive network, in that central executive network we've talked about, it almost breaks down. So it's got less uh, synchronization to itself within a network. and. Interestingly, by studying these networks, you can start to pick up um, different aspects of addiction. So someone who's relapsed or someone who's doing well and closer to, to the normal network pattern. Um, have people studied TMS in the setting of um, um, addiction? Uh, the answer is yes, there's been lots of studies uh, on addiction. So these studies uh, are, are on alcohol dependence. Predominantly in the literature, there's a predilection to using the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex as a target. And that's probably uh, because of uh, lots of depression studies and, and people not really using brain maps and navigation. Um, but an interesting target in, in the context of um, addiction is uh, the middle prefrontal cortex, which has shown some promise. Uh, but if we look at other types of addiction, uh, such as methamphetamine craving, um, we can see that again, the DLPFC and MPFC uh, is a common target. Uh, nicotine craving, again, DLPFC predominantly used as a target. Um, sorry, just going back. But when you look at the efficacy of TMS applied in the setting of addiction, it appears to be that the DLPFC is not a good target, 
but the middle prefrontal cortex appears uh, to be getting reasonable results where people have, um, have had an efficacy in terms of uh, a behavioral effect and not seeking um, drug-related behaviors. So it's definitely a field that is worth further study. And with the integration of personalized brain maps, I think it's, it's, well, it's already changing drastically. Okay, the last condition we'll uh, cover is chronic pain. So chronic pain is pain that persists past the normal healing time. Um, it lacks that acute warning function uh, for physiological nociception. And it's regarded as chronic if it um, lasts beyond three to six months. Uh, it's got a combination of both peripheral and central neurobiological factors. And up until recently, it, the, extension and, the extent and nature of changes in the brain have been very poorly understood. So what has connectomics taught us? So this study by Manu et al. Uh, looked at chronic back pain. So uh, published in 2018. And what they did is they studied patients with chronic back pain from the UK, the US and Japan and they studied their uh, functional connectome, i.e. they did a resting state functional MRIs and tried to understand uh, are there changes in the functional connectivity. When we actually look at the functional connectivity of patients with chronic pain, um, they show aberration in all of their graph metrics. So their clustering coefficient, so um, the chance that two nodes are connected within a module is um, decreased in, in patients uh, with chronic pain compared to normal patients. So what we've got here, they're pretty small graphs, but basically we've got C for control and P for chronic pain. And it's looking at the patients from Japan, UK and US, and then putting them together um, as a single group. So the brown one is the, the pain cohort and the white one is the normal cohort. So what we can see here from the clustering coefficient, the pain cohort has less clustering than the normal cohort. The same is for degree. So when we study the no de uh, degree in the network, it's reduced in patients with chronic pain. And uh, the centrality of the nodes is also reduced in patients with uh, chronic pain. Um, the group also went on to look at which parts of the brain have experienced significant reorganization um, when you compare it to normal patients um, in relation to chronic pain? So we studied chronic pain patients and normal patients, which parts of the brain have shown modular reorganization? And the part that comes up the most significantly is the sensory motor cortex. So when you study the sensory motor cortex, it's got significantly decreased modular modularity on, on a resting st uh, state functional MRI. So the, the motor and sensory cortex bilaterally doesn't integrate with itself as well as what it does for normal people. Um, other areas which have shown decreased activities, the inf inferior lateral prefrontal cortex in yellow here, uh, the temporal poles bilaterally in green, and as opposed to decreased modularity, the left interparietal sulcus shows increased uh, modularity. So this network is more connected to itself than normal people. And what, what the authors went on to do is, fine, we've got some areas that have shown increased or decreased modularity, but how do they actually connect to a part of the brain that's known to have an important function in nociception? And that part of the brain is the pregenual anterior cingulate cortex. Uh, it's been known to have um, a, a nociceptive function and be abnormal in patients with chronic pain. And when you study the connectivity of that part to other parts uh, of the brain, i.e. when we're looking at the functional MRIs and trying to pick up which parts of the brain are connected at the same time uh, to the anterior cingulate cortex, we find that again, one of the most important areas that's connected to it is the sensory motor cortex. Um, other areas of the premotor cortex and the lateral prefrontal cortex. So how does this translate into chronic uh, pain and, and TMS as an application? So again, because the chronic pain is a frustrating condition, there's been quite a lot of studies uh, using TMS for chronic pain. And it's been studied in all types of pain. So people have used it to study uh, chronic visceral pain, post-operative pain, 
Um, you can abort uh, migraine pain from a prodromal aura, although it's not very practical because patients uh, would need to run to get TMS if they got an aura. But where it's shown its greatest efficacy is in neuropathic pain, um, in pain such as chronic uh, facial pain and atypical trigeminal neuralgia, uh, post neuralgia, structural pain and MS and spinal cord injury, uh, fibromyalgia, and even small fiber polyneuropathy. And um, what the next slides are going to show is, is a study, a, a meta-analysis on randomized controlled trials in chronic pain. Uh, so this group um, analyzed um, chronic pain TMS trials from 2000 to 2018, and they differentiated uh, 12 trials, which were of high uh, caliber. And What's, what they actually also wanted to establish in this meta-analysis is what's a good target for chronic pain? Because a lot of people have been using the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, but if we look at the more recent data with the sensory motor cortex issues in chronic pain, um, that's also a really good target for uh, chronic pain. And what the authors deduced was that the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex isn't a, a good target and doesn't show um, efficacy but the motor cortex, uh, the M1 or the sensory motor area seems to be a more promising target for uh, patients with chronic pain. So again, there's a lot of work to be done in this field. And again, personalized brain mapping where you're understanding each patient's brain will uh, add a lot of uh, power to this area um, of study. Interestingly, um, another study was looking at the periaqueductal gray and trying and studying it in the setting of uh, resting state functional MRI. So what they did is, we all know that the periaqueductal gray is very important in uh, nociception and also in hampering um, pain. So they studied a thousand uh, functional MRIs in normal people, and they tried to find which patients on a resting state fMRI had correlation or which areas rather on a resting state function where I had correlation to the periaqueductal gray. And surprise, surprise, the sensory motor cortex again is very connected to that periaqueductal gray. So quite possibly modulating it through TMS could potentially work through the periaqueductal gray. Um, that completes our talk uh, tonight uh, in relation to connectomics um, and understanding a lot of the mood disorders and chronic uh, pain disorders in more detail. Um, this brings uh, an end to my talks and next week we'll be joined uh, by Professor Mike Shiguru from Sydney who will give us um, uh, more detail on some of the more um, current and interesting research going on with um, personalized brain mapping and connectomics. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks so much, Chris. It was a really fascinating session. I think it really brought it home in a clinical context and in a more practical sense uh, after the last few weeks. That was really enjoyable. Thank you. Um, I will open up again for some time for questions. Uh, I think we have had a somewhat shy audience in the past. But if any of them would like to ask a, a question or raise anything, uh, I think this is your chance. Feel free to raise your hand or type in the chat bar. Uh, and I'll be happy to meet you as well. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm sure, Chris, I, I, I'm sure we can take questions separately via email. If anyone wants to reach out to sure. you directly, I'm sure they'd be happy to. You, you'd have to take those questions as well. Um, but otherwise, I think thank you again for the past six sessions and organize the next week's session. Um, With pleasure. And we'll call it there for tonight. Thanks thank very you. much, everyone. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. Okay.